Okay, if we start early, you get out early, right? Okay. <laughs> I am happy to welcome you to the Holden Beach Chapel this morning. It's delightful to see you. Um, it's been, a, once again, a lovely week here, and uh, I'm glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. Without making it uh, too personal, Sandy had her knee replacement surgery this week, and she is um, she's doing well. Um, she is... Um, crabby sometimes, but, um, <laughs> but she's doing well. She will start her therapy tomorrow, and uh, hopefully it will not be long. In the meantime, I want to express our sincere appreciation to Rose Leonard, who is filling in for Sandy as our pianist for the next few weeks. We are certainly appreciative of her doing that. Um, by way of announcements, let me remind the trustees there is a meeting today at 1 o'clock immediately uh, following the, the worship service at 1 o'clock in the fellowship hall. It will be our first in-person meeting in a long time, and I think I would recognize all of you, but um, it'll be wonderful to be around a table and meeting once again. <clears throat> and also, Thursday evening, let me remind you choir members that we have re returned to having choir rehearsal, 7 o'clock on Thursday evening. And if you have been thinking about being a part of the choir, it's a perfect time to join. If you would come Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. So, um, now let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful world that we call home. Even though we are not always good stewards of your world, you haven't withdrawn those gentle summer breezes, soft spring rains, those glorious autumn colors, bright winter stars. You still bless us with breathtaking sunsets and birds singing, moonlit nights, flower-scented dawns. Even though we tend to be drawn to the bad news of life, you are constantly injecting the laughter of a child to balance our senses providing a wise friend to direct our ways or sending music to inspire our souls. While we may cower in fear before uncontrollable forces, you said in our midst people that we know who bravely manage pain, people who courageously face earthly life's end, those who have learned to adjust to crippling situations and still live their lives nobly. Thank you, Father, for this hour. We thank you for this gathering of folks, some of whom may be suffering loss, some may be managing pain, dealing with sins. Some may be filled with joy, and others may be seeking courage or looking for help in managed life. We pray, Lord, that none would be disappointed as we worship here today. For we pray it in your name. Amen. Now, if you would, please get your song sheet as we stand and sing together. I will sing the wondrous story. Please stand as we sing together.
remain standing, please, as we recite the Apostles' Creed, as you'll find in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, <clears throat> maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning again. Um, <clears throat> I'm not John Simmons. John is not doing well, so uh, please keep John in your prayers. Today's scripture lesson comes from Acts 3, verses 12 through 19. Peter heals a lame beggar. Leading in today's scriptures reading, Peter and John were going to the temple for the evening prayers. Now there was a lame beggar near the temple gate, and the beggar asked Peter and John for money. Peter's response was, silver and gold we have none, but what I do have I, I will gladly give you. Peter commanded him to walk, and he did. The follow, he followed Peter and John to the temple courts. The crowd was astonished and came running to them. Now be still and hear these words. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power of godlessness, we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate. Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying, His Messiah would suffer. Repent then, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The words of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Now please join me in a prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Good morning, dear God. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for this another glorious, wonderful day. And as we celebrate this third Sunday of Easter, Father, ground our faith in the reality of your presence. Through your presence during this worship, inspire us to service, to share what you have given us, and to help us to help each other to do your will. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' holy name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Continue to worship together as we stand and sing together. I stand amazed in the presence. Please stand as we sing.
pray, please? How can we fittingly thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you have blessed us? Not only materially, but also for burdens lifted and suffering assuaged and sins forgiven, life renewed, differences reconciled, hopes restored. We bring to you now a token of our gratitude and love, and we pray that because of what we do, others may also know your goodness. Amen. be seated. <clears throat> Since our guest minister and his wife are seen today, I thought I probably should introduce them and take a, something a little bit out of, uh, out of order for our bulletin. We're delighted um, to have Jeff Hartman uh, and his wife Lynn with us today. This is the first time that Jeff has been with us. He's the pastor, senior pastor at First Baptist Troy. And, um, and when I found out that he was an undergraduate music major, uh, and he said that he and his wife sang. I thought, well, this is a perfect opportunity. And um, <laughs> so as we play um, um, Fruit Basket Turnover over there, thank you. <laughs> We're glad to have him. And as, uh, if you look at his uh, resume there, uh, he got his undergraduate degree in music at, at Liberty. And then all of these universities... I mean, if you were going to try to name drop a university, this is a perfect one with a, a Master of Divinity from Princeton, and then there's a Master's from Yale and Harvard, Westminster uh, Seminary, and he's a PhD candidate at Westminster in theology. So um, we are indeed happy to have Jeff and Lynn with us today. So uh, the service is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Reggie. I lift your name on high Lord I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky 
Mom always liked you best. <laughs> if you are my age or older, and some of you appear to be, you might recognize that catchphrase from an old comedy team, the Smothers Brothers. And big brother Tommy would always say to little brother Dickie, Mom always liked you best. And that's a problem for most children. Parental favoritism has always been a problem. As a matter of fact, it's epidemic in the Bible. 
Then read the book of Genesis. And Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. He preferred Isaac. That caused a lot of problems. Isaac didn't learn anything from his parents. So when he had two sons, he preferred Esau over Jacob. But his wife, Rebecca, chose Jacob over Esau. And that nearly cost Jacob's life. But again, Jacob didn't learn anything, and he played favorites. He had 12 sons, and he picked the 11th one, Joseph, which nearly cost Joseph his life. Isn't it terrible when a parent chooses one child over another? Wouldn't it be terrible if there was that kind of sibling rivalry in the disciples of Jesus in the Gospels? Evidently, there was. You know, there were only 12 disciples. There were a lot of people who were left out of that inner circle. But even in the 12, there were three, you know, Peter, James, and John, who were favorites that got to go places that the others didn't get to go, see things that the other nine didn't get to see. Do you think there was some jealousy among those nine? And even among those three, there appears to have been a favorite. Because five times in the New Testament, one of them, John, is referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Not loved the most, not only loved, but loved. Doesn't say that about anybody else. Now, coincidentally, of the five times that the New Testament calls John the one that Jesus loved, all five of them occur in the Gospel of John. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> so John, instead of like some authors who humbly don't put their name in and they say, yours truly, no, he doesn't put his name in, but he takes the opportunity five times in the story of Jesus to say, the one that Jesus loved, this guy. And we wonder, what's going on here? How can John get away with that in the Bible? I'd like to look at these five times. Turn to John chapter 13, if you follow along in your Bible. John chapter 13, we come to the story of Jesus, and it is the upper room, the night before Jesus' death. And in verse 21, Jesus was troubled in spirit and said, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. They didn't all guess Judas. There was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, verse 23. Not Simon Peter, because Simon Peter motioned to him, the one Jesus loved, to ask him who it was of whom he spoke. Now, John always gets to sit next to Jesus. And this time, we find him not just sitting next to Jesus, but clearly almost sitting on his lap. He's in Jesus' bubble. Is Peter jealous? Does it get on his nerves that Jesus always seems to be favoring John? But here, he's sitting next to Jesus, and John insists on telling us in this story that he's the one that Jesus loves. The next time is in John chapter 19, and now we're on holy ground. This is climax of the gospel story. It's Calvary. Jesus is dying on the cross for our sins. And John not only intrudes himself on the story, he mentions this name. John 19, 25, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, a few women, not the disciples, they all ran. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Now, if you see a group photo and you're in the group photo, don't your eyes tend to gravitate towards you and, oh, that's a terrible picture of me, or, oh, that's a great picture of me, but I'm not looking at you because I'm looking for my picture, right? We're all kind of self-centered. And is John doing that with the story of the crucifixion, saying, look, there's me? We're talking about the death of Jesus here. John, what are you doing? The next time... This happens is in the next chapter, John chapter 20, and it's early on Easter morning, and ladies have found an empty tomb, but they haven't seen Jesus yet. So in John 20, verse 2, Mary, when she found the empty tomb, ran and came to Simon Peter and to the nudge, nudge, other disciple, you know, the one whom Jesus loved. Did I mention Jesus loved me? And she said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. Now, this doesn't call him 
the disciple whom Jesus loved. But I got to read you this next part because John, who keeps on telling us that he's the one Jesus loved, kind of rubs in a little bit more. If that's not irritating enough, look, they both ran together, verse 4, and the other disciple, you know, the one Jesus loved, he outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Yeah, I won the contest. Last one there is a rotten egg. John, you're a rotten egg. Who cares who got to the tomb first? Obviously, John does. He took up valuable Bible space to tell us, I won the race. He might as well be trotting out his high school trophy or his letter jacket. I'm the fastest one of the 12. He continues with the story in verse 5, and he, stooping down and looking in, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who got there first, saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. I was very sacrosanct. I was sanctimonious. I did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him. Did I mention I came in first? And Peter just barged right into the tomb. Then the other disciple, not who Jesus loved, but the other disciple who came to the tomb first. Is John getting on your nerves? You can bet he got on Peter's nerves, right? The one who came to the tomb first, he went in also. But he got there first, and he saw and he believed. Peter is clueless, doesn't know what's going on. Jesus has been warning them both for weeks that he's going to go to Jerusalem to die and to rise again, but John gets it. Peter is clueless, but John, he figures it out, and he tells us he figured it out. The fourth time is in the next chapter, John chapter 21, verse 6. There's a man on shore as the disciples are fishing. They're fishermen, right? They don't know what to do, so they go fishing. A man, a Monday morning quarterback on the shore, yells out and says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. They hadn't caught fish all night. They want to say, take a hike, but hey, it worked before. So they cast and they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved, fourth time, said to Peter, It's the Lord. I recognize his voice. As the story goes on, Peter dives in and swims to shore. John brings the fish in so he can feed Jesus breakfast. But later on in that chapter, verse 20, we see the fifth and final time. Peter has finally gotten between John and Jesus, and he's walking along the shore, and to his consternation, Jesus takes this time to get down on him and say three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter's quite upset. So in verse 20, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, John has to remind us one final time, who had leaned on his breast, remember me, he loves me, I sat next to him at the supper, and Peter said to the Lord, Lord, what about this guy? What about him? So those five times, to me, are kind of like fingernails on a chalkboard, how about you? What's going on here? Did Jesus play favorites? To us, it seems like he did. John says so in the Bible. To us, it sometimes seems like God does play favorites today. You know anybody, you know Johnny, spiritual, whose prayers all get answered? Your prayers bounce off the ceiling. If you want your prayers answered, you go and ask him. You are in line at the supermarket, and your line pulls to a stop. They get on the long line, and he's out before you are. You're stuck in traffic, and they, in the next lane, he waves and goes by and says, bless you, and you don't want to bless him, you want to strangle him. How do you think Peter felt about John? Not only does it seem like Jesus loved him, he keeps on rubbing it in. So, I got a problem with these five, because we have a dilemma. If Peter is not in the first chair, and John is, and John is the one that Jesus loved. Either John's telling us the truth, and he's a stuck-up jerk, and i got a problem with that because it's in the Bible, and why would the Holy Spirit let that be in there? Or it's not true, and it's in the Bible, and it's wrong. i got a problem with it also because if it's true, then that's something bad about God because... Jesus doesn't have favorites. He loves us all the same, right? So what's going on here? Does John have your attention? He's got my attention. Maybe he's trying to tell us something here. I hope he's trying to tell us something here more than just, Jesus loved me best. So what's going on here? 
Maybe instead of wanting to strangle him, we ought to try and emulate him. Maybe we ought to go back over those five texts one more time, and instead of looking at John bragging, quote-unquote, about his special position, maybe we ought to look at what John is doing in those five cases that maybe, just maybe, he's hinting to us, here's something that you can do so you can be the one that Jesus loves. Anyone want to be Jesus' favorite? Let's go back to John chapter 13. Notice what he's doing. John 13, 21, it starts this way. Jesus was troubled in spirit. Oh, he was troubled. The next day he was going to die on a cross, not only a physically excruciating way to die, the most torturous way human beings have ever invented. He's going to carry the sins of the world. He's going to be alienated from his father. His disciples are going to betray him, deny him, forsake him. Jesus is troubled in spirit. But let's look at John. What is John doing? John is sitting down next to Jesus, got his arm around Jesus, looking into Jesus' eyes with those big puppy dog eyes, and his heart is breaking for Jesus. Do you remember what the other 11 disciples were doing in the upper room? They were arguing about what? about who was the greatest. John wasn't arguing. John was looking at Jesus, and I'd like to think he was there for Jesus. I have three children, all three of them grown, two boys and a girl. One of them, growing up, was much more sensitive than the others. I don't want to embarrass her, so I won't tell you which one. (laughs) But she would constantly ask me, Dad, are you okay? Now, most of the time, I was okay. I'm easygoing. Everything's fine. I was just quiet, so she thought maybe I was mad or something. But once in a while, she'd hit the nail on the button, and something was bothering Dad. Things weren't going well at church. Couldn't pay a bill. Someone was sick. Someone was dying. And she'd say, Dad, are you okay? And most of the time, I'd say, I'm fine, dear. But when things were not okay, I'd try to tell her the truth. I was troubled in spirit. Pray for dad. She would always say the same thing. Dad, can I do anything? Now, she wasn't only a kid, but she was disabled. There was nothing she could do to solve my problem. But don't you know, it felt good in my heart to know that somebody noticed and somebody cared, and she practiced her gift. Her spiritual gift is hugging. This has been the hardest past year of her life. She can't hug anybody but her mom and I. And don't you know, it felt good to have her love. Don't you know that it blessed Jesus' heart to have somebody in that upper room who wasn't arguing about who's the greatest, but someone who was just loving him and being there for him? John, sorry, there's nothing you can do for me. You can't die in my place tomorrow. I'm going to be dying in your place tomorrow. But thanks, buddy, for being there. It really meant the world to me. What is John doing? Here's what he's doing. Here's the first hint. John wants to grab our attention. And I'd say he's pretty successful in doing that by telling us that he was the one that Jesus loved. He's trying to tell us how to be the one that Jesus loved. So he says, if you want to be the one that Jesus loves, become intimate with Jesus. Be his best friend. Just be there for him. You know, when we picture Christianity, we picture religion, the negative part, the don'ts. That's not even the good half. The good half is the do's that the don'ts free us from doing those things so we can do the right things. He didn't even just save us the negatives from hell, from death. He he saved us for heaven. He saved us for friendship with him. Salvation is not from our sins. It's salvation to Jesus. And here... John is doing what it's all about. It's about leaning on Jesus' bosom. But, of course, we don't have the privilege that John did. Jesus is not here in the flesh. So how can we be like John? Well, we could talk to him. We know that talking to him is prayer. But all too often, we settle for prayer, you know, spiritual discipline that we do because we have to, because we're guilted into it, or because we really need something. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is talking to your best friend. And how does he talk back? Well, we know it's in the Bible. And when we read it, if we read it, it's because we have to. It's a course textbook. It's required reading. It's a spiritual discipline like 
eating your vegetables. You do it because it's good for you. But that's not what it is either. The Bible is God's love letter to us. Have you ever gotten a love letter? If you did, I guarantee you didn't skim over it, say, that's nice, and throw it away, right? You read it, and you poured over every word, and you treasured it, and you read it again, and you maybe still have it. If it's not a former boyfriend or girlfriend, you probably still have it. That's what the Bible is, and that's what it's supposed to be about, but somehow we've turned it into a chore. When I was young, that's what I thought Christianity was. I thought it was all about serving God. And then that verse came home to me where Jesus answered the question, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And I realized I'd been missing it for years. I was serving God. I was on his waiter's staff. I was reading the Bible, and I was praying, and I was doing all these good things for God, but I just didn't know him. I didn't love him. I kind of knew him like I know the president. Yeah, I recognize him in a lineup. I know his name, but he doesn't know me. I'm not invited into the Oval Office. But I am invited into the throne room of heaven if I want to take advantage of going there every day. Do I really know him? John is telling us, do what I was doing in the upper room. Just become intimate with Jesus. Don't pray. Talk to him. Don't read your Bible. Read God's love letter to you. We have the privilege of doing what, Jesus, what John did, being there for Jesus, what tragically 11 disciples missed. Look at the second text, John chapter 19. Again, we are at the cross. But what is John doing? I don't want to take our eyes off of Jesus on the cross, but I want to do what John's doing. Maybe John is giving us a secret here. And when we look at what he's doing, there stood by the cross of Jesus a few women, one man, John. Why did Jesus love him? You know what John was doing? He probably had his arm around Mary like he did around Jesus in the upper room the night before, holding her up from collapsing in absolute grief. Jesus' heart was broken, but he had a concern at that moment. And so he looked down at John and he looked at his mother and he said, Mom, look what they've done to me. Behold your son, he said, John, I want you to take care of my mother. I'm not going to be there to take care of her. Where are Jesus' brothers? Mary had other children, but they're not there. Jesus said, I want you to look after my mom. What was close to Jesus' heart on Calvary's Hill? Those that he loved. If you want to do what John was doing, what was John doing? Caring about those that Jesus loved. So if you want a second hint to being the one that Jesus loved, do what John did. Care for those that Jesus cares for. Connect with God's family. For us, it's worshiping together in, in the church. You see, we were made in God's image. And part of being God's image is our social nature. We were made for community. God himself, think about it, didn't create us because he was lonely, because he needed someone to talk to. He was already a connected community of three persons, Father, Son, and spirit. He didn't need us, but he had so much love he wanted to share that love with others. Like the Father, we need to be with others. Worshiping God, loving God is a team sport, not an individual sport. We can't do it alone. So we don't come together just because the Bible says we have to as a duty. We don't come together like you go to a, a theater or you go to a class and you listen to a lecture, you look at the back of somebody else's head, and then you leave a stranger like you do at the end of a movie. No, we actually get to know each other because we are made to be together. And so if you don't want to be together with others, if this coronavirus has kind of been nice, I'll just stay home and watch in my pajamas. Maybe I'll never go back. Listen, John has a message for you. In his first letter after the gospel, John writes 1 John 4.20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. But he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? John is saying, if you insist that you love God but you don't love being around his people, maybe you're not one of his people. If you want to be like me, then you want to love those that Jesus loves and take care of those. John is not saying, I'm special, you don't get it tough. No, he's saying, come on in, the water's fine, the more the merrier. I want you to have what I have. The third time is in the next chapter, John chapter 20. And again, I want you to notice 
what John is doing. Jesus is not in the story. It's easy now to focus on John. And John is running, foot race with Peter, to the empty tomb. And what is John? They are both running together, verse 4. But John outran Peter and came to the tomb first. You know what I think upon further reflection? This is not about speed. This is about passion. He's running. He's not jogging to the tomb. He's not casually strolling to the tomb. He is running all out. When my daughter was young, she has cerebral palsy, and so she has to wear braces on her legs, and she has to use a walker. But it was misnamed a walker for her because she didn't walk anywhere. She ran everywhere she went. Made her mom and I have heart attacks because we were afraid she'd fall over and crack her head open. Her teachers didn't want her to run, wouldn't let her. But any chance she had, she'd run. And what she would always say to me when she wasn't saying, are you okay? She'd say, Dad, how come you never run? I wanted to say, I'm old. But she asked so many times, I thought I was old then. She asked me so many times, I came up with a stock answer that I used every time. Hun, if I want to get somewhere sooner, I'll leave sooner. I don't want to run. The only time she ever saw me run was when she went too fast and tipped the walker over, and then I ran. Why? Because I run for what I'm passionate about. What will you run for? What do you care about? You know, it's kind of hard to get passionate about religion, isn't it? Do's and don'ts, a bunch of rules. But it's easy to get passionate about a person who gave himself for us. And so in John's case here, he's telling us a third hint. Don't miss this. Here's what it's all about. It's about giving priority to Jesus. Not only be intimate, but be passionate about him. Find something worth putting your whole life into it, and there are very few things, I'd say one, and put your whole self into it. Many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, I was walking down the boardwalk, and someone came toward me with a t-shirt. T-shirts and greeting cards have some of the funniest lines on them. And this one I'd never heard, never seen before, said, what if the hokey pokey really is what it's all about? (laughs) And I laughed out loud. You have to know the song, right? The children's song, you know, you put your left foot in and you, take, you shake it all about. And then it ends up, it, that's what it's all about. That's absurd. It's not all about that stupid little song, right? I'm walking down the boardwalk laughing. And I thought, wait a minute. The last verse says you put your whole self in. And that's what it's all about. And I went out, and I couldn't find the T-shirt, so I got a bumper sticker, and I put it on my desk. What if the hokey pokey really is what it's all about? Put your whole self into something. All three children, as they graduated, I told them the same thing. Nobody ever enjoyed anything they did half-heartedly. Find something worthwhile to sink your life into, Jesus, and do that. That's what it's all about. Jesus put it right in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33. Maybe you've memorized it. Maybe you've sung it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You seek anything else, you'll catch it, you'll be bored with it, and it'll leave you deflated. But if you seek first the kingdom of God, you can enjoy everything else. You put anything else first, it becomes an idol. You put Jesus first, and all those other things can be yours. Here, John, of course, is not bragging about speed, trotting out his high school track trophies, No, he's giving us the secret to life. You want to be the disciple that Jesus loved, then then actually what you want to do is become intimate with him, connect with his family, be passionate about him, give priority to him. Look later on in that same story. We won't go to the next time he's called the disciple in Jesus. But remember, he didn't go into the tomb first, verse 5. John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there. And he noticed it. Maybe it was folded in a way that he recognized Jesus folded his napkin after every meal. He did not go in. Peter came following him. He went in the tomb. So then John went in and he saw and he believed. John saw something more than an empty tomb. He saw a folded napkin. Hey, nobody steals a body and takes the time to unwrap it. Something's happened here. Wait a minute. Jesus told us a dozen times that he was going to rise again. He saw 
and he believed. He gets it. Peter's clueless. John gets it. What John does here, a fourth hint is, he believed Jesus. He trusted him. He didn't need, like doubting Thomas, to see Jesus. He believed already. He didn't need to stick his finger in the nail print. He believed him. And that's what someone you're intimate with, that's what you do. You believe them, right? That's exactly what Ananias did for Saul, who became Paul. Saul was on his way to town to kill all the Christians. When he got there and claimed to be one of them, nobody wanted to have anything to do with Saul until Ananias came alongside of him, put his arm around him, and said, I believe in you. And because of him, we have the Apostle Paul and three-quarters of the New Testament. Somebody believed in me. My grandmother believed in me, and it's one of the reasons why I'm here today. I had two grandmothers praying for me every day and a mother who still prays for me every day. Someone believed in me, and it made all the world. We have to learn to trust him. Yes, become intimate with him, but trust him. When I was very young, my parents would take me to the doctor, and every time I went to the doctor, it seems to me he'd pull out a needle and stick it into me. And I began to hate the doctor, but then I began to think, wait a minute, my parents brought me here, and they knew he was going to give me a needle. My parents must not love me. I got a little bit older and figured out, hey, wait a minute, they're, they're paying the doctor to give me this pain. They hate me. I got a little bit older, and I realized that there was some wisdom in the doctor and my parents. He was giving me a shot, a little pain now, to avoid a bigger pain later. Isn't God wise enough to treat us that way? Can't we trust Him? Job says in Job 13, 15, even if He slays me, yet will I trust Him. Can you trust God? You sure can. He knows what He's doing. He may allow you to go through a little pain now to avoid a bigger pain later. When I was a little bit older in college, I wasn't quite sure if I could trust Jesus yet. And so when every time we would sing, all to Jesus I surrender, I would hold back two things, my job and my life's mate. Lord, I, I would like to say I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll marry whoever you want me to marry, but I'm afraid I just didn't trust God enough. I figured, oh, he'll make me be a missionary or worse, a pastor. <laughs> and little did I realize that that's exactly what he had hardwired me to do. And I couldn't be happy doing anything else. As a matter of fact, I still can't believe I get paid to do what I would pay to do. Don't tell my church. <laughs> they pay me to do what I would pay to do. The other one was the big one. I don't want to marry someone. I'm not going to say, Lord, all to Jesus I surrender. I want to pick her out, not you. But after struggling with it for a while, I said, okay, Lord, I trust you. And it seems like it was maybe the next day when I saw a beautiful young woman up on the stage at Liberty College, and I said, that's the one, God, that's the one, please. I told my roommate, and he said, you'll never get her. <laughs> and here she is in the front row. To me, the most beautiful woman in the world couldn't have picked a better person for me. She's even a great singing partner. God gave me exactly what I needed when I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I trusted him, and then all these things were added to me. You can trust God. That's what John wants us to know. You can trust him. If you have already trusted him with your eternity, I trust you have. You trust him with where you're going to spend forever after you die. Can't you trust him for a few days for today and for tomorrow with what you're going to see in life today. Let's go to another one, and this one is in 21, verse 6. Remember, Jesus calls out from the beach, cast the net on the right side of the boat. He's done this to him before. You will find some fish. They cast. They were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. You know what John is doing here? John is staying responsibly in the boat, bringing the fish back to feed Jesus breakfast. Peter says, you're not beating me to Jesus this time. He swims in. Maybe he's a better swimmer than John. Peter gets there, but then he looks back, and John's not chasing him. He's bringing the fish in, foiled again. But what is John doing in this story? He's recognizing the voice of Jesus. About 10 years ago, I went back to my alma mater, Liberty University, because my oldest son was graduating from there. It was a proud moment. After the graduation, I was 
packing up his stuff into the van, hoping it would all fit. And an old man walked by. And when I called out to my son, this old man said, Jeff? Jeff Hartman? I said, yeah. I turned around. Here's an old guy I didn't recognize. He says, I didn't recognize you because you look old. (laughs) But I recognized your voice. And then I recognized his voice. Brad? Brad Fraley? Yeah, we both changed, but our voices didn't that much. You ever hear someone's voice familiar doing a voiceover on a commercial, and it's a sportscaster or it's an actor that you know, and they hire and pay them a lot of money because somehow you trust that voice. I can recognize my wife's laugh anywhere. You might hear her laugh once or twice in church. You can't miss it. It lights up every room. Back in the days before we had cell phones, if we got separated in the store, all I had to do was just be quiet for a moment, and I could hear her laughing on the other side of the store and just follow it like radar. I know my wife's voice because I know my wife, and so beyond just being intimate with her, I'm familiar with her. I recognize her voice. Here's the question. Do you recognize Christ's voice? Do you recognize His touch in your life? Just a few verses earlier in this chapter, John chapter 20, you remember when Mary finally saw Jesus, she went back to the tomb after Peter and John had left the tomb, and then tears were filling her eyes, and she looked, and she saw a man supposing him to be the gardener. She said, if you took him, tell me where he is. She didn't know it was Jesus. She didn't recognize his voice when he asked, what's the problem? But when he said Mary, she recognized his voice. You know, nobody says your name like Jesus. Has Jesus called your name? Do you recognize, maybe you don't get to hear his voice, but do you get to see his hand in your life? Do you recognize his hand in life? Our oldest, the one who graduated from Liberty that time, we always recognized his handiwork, especially on April Fool's Day. If you turned on the faucet and the sprayer was taped open so it sprayed you in the face, or if you walked into some wax paper or something, yeah, that was his handiwork. When he was home, we knew he was home because there were his shoes in the front hall and his pants on the stairs and his clothes everywhere. Josh's home. Do you recognize God's hand in your life? God wants to leave a little hand purpose in your path, but do you get the clues? Do you know what's going on? Do you recognize his voice in your life? Here is the, the next one, the last one, the fifth time. We want to become familiar with him. We want to become intimate with him and passionate about him and trust him and be familiar with him. But notice in John 21, 20, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who had laid on his breast at the supper. He said, but Lord, what about this man? So we know what Peter's doing. He's walking next to Jesus and proud of it. We know what Jesus is doing, predicting the future, saving the world. What's John doing? Peter, for once, has weaseled his way in between John and Jesus, and so he's taking advantage of it, but Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Now he's upset. So he takes his eyes off of Jesus, and he looks back at John and says, hey, what about this guy? What's John doing? He's not taking his eyes off Jesus for one second, because Jesus left one time a few days ago, and he's not going to let Jesus out of his sight. What is Peter doing? What you and I do all too often. We get our eyes off Jesus, and we look at other people, don't we? Oh, look what this preacher did. Oh, look what that person's wearing to church. Listen to what this person said. And we look at other people, and we ultimately, inevitably, get discouraged. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus like John, John is attached to Jesus. Jesus, he knows, is not going to be there long, so he wants to spend every minute watching Jesus. He's not going to turn around and look at anybody else. He has become, here's the sixth clue about being the disciple that Jesus loved. Beyond being intimate and familiar and passionate about him, you want to become attached to him. I say this often about my wife. If she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. (laughs) I have become attached to her. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. That's the way John was with Jesus. I'm not letting him go. Do you remember the story of Jacob in the Old Testament, Genesis 32? He's, He's wrestling with a man, supposedly, Now, Jacob is the famous con man, the deceiver, who conned his brother, and he conned his father, and he conned his father-in-law. But now he's wrestling this man, and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Is he trying to con God? No, he is doing what friends of God do. He's attached to God. I'm not letting. He's a changed man now. He's not Jacob. He's Israel. 
And he is like the friends of God, Abraham, a friend of God, David, a man after God's own heart, Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is attached to God. So, does God play favorites? Did Jesus play favorites with John? And is there nothing you can do about it? Far from it. The Bible is, and especially the Gospel of John, is an invitation to join the party. John is written to convince us that Jesus is God, but John has a secondary motivation. He wants us to be friends with, to love, to be intimate with, to be familiar with and attached to this one who's not only the God, the creator of the universe, but wants to be your best friend. Dozens of times the Bible says the same thing. God is no respecter of persons. It says it in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, Acts 10, 34, Romans 2, 11, many other times. The old King James, no respecter of person. New King James, other versions say he shows no partiality. Or we could say this way, he plays no favorites. What is John doing? He's trying to tell us God doesn't have favorites. Well, yes, he does. It's just we're all his favorites. You know, when there's a Christmas play and all the kids are up there, I love being the pastor, looking at out the, the great shows, not up on the stage with all the kids. Great shows out there with all the people. And every one of them has got one kid their eye is trained on. Well, that's God with you and with me and with all of us. Because God is infinite and his heart and his love is infinite. He can have as many as there are people, that many favorites. And he wants you to be. So how do you do that? Jesus' brother James tells us in James 4, 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Jesus loved all 12 disciples, including Judas, died for all of them. But here's what John wants us to know. 11 of them missed out on the best, being friends with Jesus. 11 were too busy trying to get something from him to just love him. When I was very young, I used to read the Reader's Digest that my parents were subscribed to. And I always love reading the jokes. And I'll never forget this one that I read in probably the late 60s or early 70s. A couple was sitting in their car, parked at night. It was a moonlit night, very romantic. It was one of those bench seats. You remember before bucket seats where you could put three people in the front row? She was seated all the way over against the passenger door. He was seated behind the wheel at the driver's side door. She looked up at the moon and she looked over at her husband and said, Remember when we used to sit so close together you couldn't fit a piece of paper between us? And the husband smiled and said, yes, I haven't moved. (laughs) It's not laugh out loud like the hokey pokey, but it's really heartbreaking because that's God. If you have left your first love, Jesus says, I haven't moved. I'm right here. I want to love you. I want to be your best friend. What I'm waiting for is I'm waiting for you to let me love you. John wasn't Jesus' favorite. All of them were, but John did something none of the other disciples did. He let let Jesus love him. Jesus said in 10.10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He didn't just come to save you from sin. He came to be your best friend, to fill your life with joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. One last Julia story. My daughter and I all of her life have played the same game. We call it the game... One of us would start with the three words, I love you. We say it every day. But the game would start when the second person says, I love you too, because then the first person gets to say, I love you more. And the other one gets to say, I love you best. And then we go on, I love you first, I love you, and then you make up the adjective, the adverb. The winner was always the one who said, I love you times infinity. Whoever got to I love you times infinity was the winner. The good thing about the game is there's no loser. If you lose, you're still love times infinity. But then we'd cheat and go into extra innings. I love you times infinity plus one. There is no infinity plus one. Okay, I love you infinity times infinity. I will never forget the time I first played the game with Jesus. And I said, Jesus, can we play the game? I love you. And before the word you got out... God spread out his arms and said, I love you just for me, times infinity. I love you this much. 
I've never gotten over it. If you ever have the privilege of practicing these six things and becoming like John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and someone says to you, Jesus always loved you best. Don't get all proud about it. Do what John tried to do, what I'm trying to do this morning. Pay it forward and say, Jesus loves you just as much as he loves me. All you have to do is let him. Let him love you, and you can be the disciple that Jesus loved. Jesus, thank you for loving us so much. I stand amazed in the presence of one who should have turned away when we turned away from you, but thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. Lord, if there's one here or someone watching who's never trusted as you as Savior, I pray that today they would accept your unspeakable gift of salvation through Jesus' blood at Calvary's cross. Lord, for those of us who are your children, I pray that every one of us today would keep that first and great commandment and just start loving you. Lord, if we just love you, we don't need the rules. We keep all the commandments. If we just love you, if we love you and love our neighbor, Lord, we'll do those things, not because we have to, but because we want to. Lord, we want to love you. Lord, we want to be that disciple, and we want to, like John, share it. That love that we have, we want to say, come on in, the water's fine. If your head's still bowed this morning, we want to sing together, Jesus Loves Me. I don't think you need the words, but I want to teach you a new verse. Let's sing, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. I want to sing you a verse that's not on your song sheet. Listen to the words. You love Jesus, but does he know? Do you ever tell him so? Jesus wants to hear you say that you love him every day. Sing the chorus, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do know he first loved you. You know he first loved you. Would you close your eyes for just a minute and I want to give you a moment just to say, maybe you haven't said it to him in a while, Jesus, I love you. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for coming and dying for us, for all that you did for us, because you loved us, because you wanted us to love you. Lord, forgive us for settling for second best and serving you. Lord, help us to spend the rest of our lives putting our whole self into loving you. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming today. God bless you.